I don't need uh, audio, okay. So, <laughs> okay. Parmesan cheese. Worcestershire sauce. Now, if you don't have this, you can eat. Can you disable the audio? Seems like. There are too many videos for me to. Is there, can you just silent the. I, I couldn't, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't. Oh. Okay, let me. I, I can fix this. Yeah. Sure? Yep, 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 yep. Okay, fixed. All right. <laughs> okay, third time. Let's see. Why the make is always slow compared to Windows? <laughs> Always causing trouble on the bus. <laughs> okay. Let's see, it's not coming back. <coughs> needs the audio. Yeah, it needs the audio, exactly. <laughs> Multimodality. <laughs> okay, okay, we're back. So. I think events are central to human experience, and we really care about understanding what people do. And you know, people do all kinds of stuff. You know, they play with tigers, dance, and so on. So I think one of the central events in, in human life is cooking. So let's say that we're going to watch a. To start oh, come on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's it. So let's say that um, uh, one of the. Okay, let me actually see if I can disable from here. Yeah, all right. Perfect. Got it now. So let's say that we are going to watch this uh, cooking show, all right? And as we see all the events unfold in the video, I want you to think about what events you perceive with respect to a temporal scale, okay? So let's say we have this temporal scale here. And as we see only a few seconds, we perceive what I call atomic actions, which are, for example, some, something like cut onions or place pasta and so on. But as we see more of the event, we perceive that these atomic actions actually are part of more complex actions. Um, and as we see more of the video, we realize that they actually are sequences of these complex actions uh, as, the re as the person is sort of reaching uh, sub goals, for example, preparing the sauce. And again, as we, see, as we continue on in our temporal scale, we finally see the completion of this very long-term task. For example, in this case, making spaghetti. So I think the key observation for me here is that events are naturally organized in this kind of in a hierarchical way. And one question, of course, is, is this partonomy of events important? Do we need to care about the composition of events into subcomponents? And, uh, and you know, we, we heard from Jeff earlier today, I think there is a lot of interesting insights of what we can get from human event perception. And it seems like for, that for human event perception, such understanding of hierarch the hierarchical structure of events is critical for building representations of what we see, uh, what's happening in the world. It's also critical for planning the one's actions, but also remembering, as we saw a lot of the memory uh, work earlier, uh, what has happened. So I think there is, there is a case to be made for computer vision systems that need to understand events to be able to parse this hierarchy and understand events uh, with such a hierarchical context. But the problem for computer vision is then how do we deal and, and represent this compositionality? How do we uh, leverage uh, the composition of events? And, um, and how do we deal with the continuity of events, as we see in this temporal scale? There is some kind of continuum of, uh, in the, within this spectrum uh, as we think of, of, of the different events that happen. So let me talk about the, some of the work we have been doing in different parts of, of this temporal scale. So one way to deal with this compositionality issue is to start by building algorithms that actually can start recognizing such atomic actions and, and then go from there, okay? So remember that at this scale, we care about things like cutting onions or placing pasta. All right, so let's, let's try to see what we can do here. So at this scale uh, of atomic actions, uh, we've built algorithms for, for the problem of uh, temporal, scale, uh, temporal action detection. And the idea here is that you're given an input video like this, and the goal is to output the start and end of the actions together with the label of the action that is happening. All right, so that's the goal. And, um, and so, so what we did here is to propose a model that we call the uh, single uh, or the SSTAD model uh, for this task. So, and the idea here is that 
we want to process the video in, into a single pass, in just in the same way as the object detection uh, models such as YOLO and SSD. So we take in the video, we want to see every frame only once without uh, dual processing of, of each frame. So single pass. And the intuition that we're going to use here for our model design is, to, is we want to detect when the action ends, while at the same time the model remembers when the action had started earlier. Okay, so for this design we have implicitly, we have to use two subtasks. One is that of uh, localization, so remembering where the location of the event has happened in the video, and the other one is classification of what is happening within each interval. All right, so with that uh, design philosophy, uh, we've, uh, we can take a look at some of the details of the model. So the idea here is that we take a, a video and we divide it into short clips. So these video clips here are, can then be uh, encoded with some of the existing video encoders using convolutional neural networks, for example, C3D. And then these encodings can go through uh, recurrent uh, memory modules, which uh, can perform the, sub the subtasks of uh, localization and classification. And finally, we use these uh, outputs to produce intervals, which kind of uh, end at the current time step, but also can remember when the action potentially had started in the past. And for each potential interval that we care about, we also can classify the category uh, which it belongs. <coughs> so one thing that is interesting for this model is that, uh, or, or let's say you want to mention two inter interesting things about this model. The first one is, we develop something that we call semantic constraints, where the idea is that uh, is the following. Uh, you know, when you have uh, a model like this, there are sort of multiple tasks that you're trying to solve. On one hand, you have this sub-localization task, uh, localization subtask, you have a classification subtask, and you have your end goal of detection. So for each of them, you can create a loss function, and the usual way to train this is by uh, using multitask learning, where you, fit, you set sort of the importance of each task at the beginning and let the model train. What we found here is that we can create a, a task curriculum that we call semantic constraints, where the idea is you start first by having more emphasis on the easier tasks uh, at the beginning, and as the train progresses, you start giving more emphasis to the harder, more difficult task that you want to solve at the end, which is sort of the detection task. And the interesting outcome of this is that we can show that by using this task curriculum, uh, we're able to learn quicker and more accurately to predict actions. All right, so these are actually older results we showed a, a couple years ago. Uh, so the only thing I want to mention at this point is that this single pass strategy through videos can uh, uh, achieve very high performance uh, in terms of computation speed. So we have roughly 700 frames per second uh, speed in, in an older GPU now. So we recently, so the second thing I want to mention for this model is that we recently revisited the visual encoder part of the model, which at that time we were using an older C3D model, but we now replace it with a um, P3D, a newer backbone. And what we found is that actually our model jumps up in performance to be probably state of the art for those models that only use RGB and no motion augmentation, so, or no optical flow. So I think that's an interesting outcome to, to sort of revise older models with a, a newer uh, feature extraction. And here's an example, let's see, an example video result of, uh, let's see if we can play the videos, um, of basketball uh, dunk and uh, also uh, jumping into a pool. And you see that the video sort of speeds up through a lot of background non-interesting events and focuses on the small action in, 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 the, in the long video. So that's what we have been doing for atomic actions and uh, one limitation, of course, is that we cannot always dec discretize the space of actions into tokens that are useful. So this may be, used, may, may be okay for some domains in which, you know, for example, sports, for, for, for which we can decide you know, what is the vocabulary of actions, but many, many times uh, it is difficult to, to go beyond that. So, so one, way, one thing we observe is that as we go up into the more complex uh, temporal scale, um, it's not very clear that we can guarantee that we have access to all those tokens. So one idea is that maybe we can embrace, instead of thinking of how do we decompose into specific tokens, we can just embrace the compositionality of language to dri drive our perception models. So um, let's see, so, so we study the, this problem
go from here to a more um, grounded causal dependency structure where we can say which steps depend on, on what other steps and what's the objects that are being manipulated at each point. So the two key components here is we need to figure out the dependencies between steps and the gr grounding the objects that are being manipulated at each moment. So let's say we're watching again an instructional video for how to make a Caesar salad and we see something like that and we hear the instructor say now take the green mixture which uh, probably means that uh, the person is going to manipulate that ball over there. So we can easily do that association between the sentence and the, and the objects. Um, but uh, sometimes the structure is uh, not as clear and may use a, a vague language. For example, they may say, uh, now take it. So what is it? It's very hard to create an it detector. Uh, or maybe just say take. So the only way to solve this is, or to ground that um, uh, phrase or freeform text to the, to the image is to use context. So here, um, the key is that we want to see what has happened in the past to try to associate the, uh, cor the, the correct box. So, so our model now has two tasks. One is to figure out what the references are to the previous steps, and uh, while at the same time grounding the specific uh, 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 text to, to, to the ground, to the video. Uh, so the way we solve this is by using a joint model that solves for these two edges. You can imagine this is sort of a temporal graph over the video and we want to figure out what these edges are. So the way the model works is by having this kind of sort of dual processing of solving for references uh, that is using the grounding, the current grounding solution and at the same time we, or alt uh, alternation, we um, ground the, the nouns to the, to the image by understanding what's the prior references. So this sort of works together in a synchronous way to solve the, for the two edges. All right, so we, we can put this together. Uh, we can see that uh, we can take this instructional video of making a spaghetti and we can create a graph that sort of describes the, the structure and, um, and uh, let's see. Let's take a one more minute to finish up. And um, the structure of the task. And if we could take a closer, closer look, we can see that the model is sort of able to provide groundings for all the objects that are being manipulated, even when the, they are not being even mentioned, but they are implicit um, in some of the sentences. And we can see that this, the composition holds over the full video. Okay, so. So I think this is really exciting because this graph is potentially a path towards a grounded dependency graph, a structure that can really give us a causal uh, dependencies. I don't think it's still there yet, but it's sort of moving in that path of understanding this task structure. All right, so I had one more thing to talk about, but I'm gonna skip that um, given that time is short. I'm gonna finish up by saying that there are many open questions. Um, I think looking back at this part autonomy of events, there is clearly a lot to be explored, and to me, it's important to think about how many levels do we need to use in this hierarchy? How do we define those levels? When do we use discrete units or tokens? Or when can we use language to drive understanding? Um, is, the, is even this partonomy important or not? So I think those are interesting questions to, to think about the vendor understanding. So that's from all you have to for today. Thank you. <laughs>